Hi, everybody. Welcome to this afternoon's event hosted by the Department of Landscape Architecture. Uh, it's times like these that uh, I feel very lucky to be a landscape architect and to know someone um, like Steve Spears. Uh, Steve has an unusual heritage here. He was born here in Yorktown, raised here, and went to school here. And today he has some of his family here, and I'd like to acknowledge them by just give a wave. We, we always talk about Cap being a family, and I, I think this is just wonderful that they're all here. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, Steve is a principal with Design Workshop. He is a landscape architect. He's a certified planner. He's an urban designer with 15 years of professional experience throughout the United States, Australia, and New Zealand, where he has designed significant projects in uh, the realm of a whole list of things. And a lot of those things are designed by people who are registered architects and landscape architects. And when they're registered, they have to take their certificate certification credits to maintain their registration. We have uh, this lecture being broadcast and it's also available for registration if you need continuing education because you are a registered architect or landscape architect. There are two forms over here you need to fill out. Um, Steve has uh, lectured all over uh, the, the, uh, the world in, and has worked on projects such as parks, plazas, redevelopments, mixed use, streets and corridors, trails and greenways, retail facilities, campuses, resorts, communities, for just a couple years out of school. Eh? So his experience in landscape architecture, urban design, and site planning has primarily focused on placemaking. Stephen's desire to balance the environmental, community, economic, and artistic benefits in every project creates successful results, many of which have been recognized with awards on numerous occasions. He's a graduate of this college. Um, he also went to the University of Texas at Austin's College of Fine Arts. This is where he is stationed now in Austin. And his work uh, has been recognized uh, by many people in the United States and uh, Europe. Please give me a help in welcoming Steve. Thank you for having me here. Can everyone hear me in the back? Great. Lauren, good to see you back there. College friend from the days. <clears throat> Tonight I'm going to be speaking about the idea of seasons and that we as humans have seasons, that we go through many of the same psychological changes that we see in the natural world. And the question at hand is how we advance out of that specific season and what we do. No different than when a seed falls to the ground and it grows into the earth and then plenishes uh, new fruit. How do we as humans adapt to those seasons and experiences that we have? Can anyone tell me what this photograph is? Just yell it out. Anyone? Mary, you can't. That's my sister. She knows. Anyone? This is Manhattan, September 11th, 2014. I just happened to be flying over the city that night, uh, literally at the stroke of midnight. This is the World Trade Center lighting up. And I was listening to that Foo Fighter song. Uh, I did grow up in the grunge era, so uh, it's still very, very much with me. And it made me realize that times like these that, that we're faced with in a whole world that's dealing with a whole level of issues that we didn't even imagine as children uh, are right in front of us today. And so how, how do we make, make changes that are positive? And what I've concluded out of that is that really we are one organism and it's tied to humanity and ecology. Whether you're an architect, a landscape architect, planner, or preservationist, you deal with this in, in what you do and that we have a connection with nature, whether we like it or not. And it is in giving that we receive. No different than it is in giving of a tree, dropping its seed to receive new life for, for the coming year. 
And so when you combine those two together, it's something of extraordinary value that will bring positive impacts to community. I, I quickly want to walk you through my timeline and my life of, in various seasons. And so I'm going to start with the Indiana years. I was born in 1974. Uh, my first camping trip that I think was in 1976. If not, it was around that era. But by 1979, the cornfield that I grew up across the street from was my playground. I had declared it as my own. Whether it be running through the uh, rows of corn or after harvest, admittedly throwing corn cobs at cars as they drove by. I grew up in small town Indiana. There wasn't a whole lot to do. But I grew up my entire life living outdoors. My parents allowed me that opportunity. My metrics of success every day was how much dirt I had underneath my fingernails when my parents finally made me come home. And I was able to camp every month. I was also a member of Boy Scouts and I became an Eagle Scout. And in 1993, I graduated high school. These are a few examples of my life growing up. My brother showing me tricks on his bike. You can see the cornfield across the street to my brother's fabulous hair holding the fishing pole. I'm the cool kid in the orange. Uh, to camping with my family and canoeing up in the Boundary Waters in Minnesota. But the other thing is that I was blessed with I was blessed with a servant leader, somebody who leads by serving. Eddie Vedder wrote this very, very clear, I thought, in the song Breathe. Nothing you would take, everything you gave. And that described my dad. In 1993, I joined, uh, or I went to Ball State and majored in fine arts. Admittedly, I didn't really understand what my life's goal was at the time, but by 1995, I had entered into the College of Architecture and Planning after applying three times to get into the college. It's a true fact. But that's where the journey really began. In 1997, I went on the polyarch trip to North Africa and Europe, and in 1999, I graduated from Ball State in that same year. I uh, married Rebecca Leonard, who is also a CAP alum and the president of our company, Design Workshop. But something happened to me in 1997 that I never understood at the time. The area circled in red was my home. And when I left to go on the polyarch trip in 1997, I grew up across, the, or I had a cornfield across the street. And when I came home, I had a subdivision across the street. My playground had been destroyed. That helped me decide a couple things in my life. One was is that maybe Indiana wasn't for me, in fact. And that, that was hard to accept. Well, in 1997, I also went on a trip called Archie Down Under. It was a trip through the College of Architecture and Planning. There were 16 of us that were selected to go overseas to do a series of charrettes over three weeks. And that's where I met Rebecca. She was a couple years older than me. We sat on a plane from Los Angeles to Sydney, and the rest is history. That following year, in 1998, I did an internship with, uh, in Australia. In 2000, Rebecca and I moved there, and in 2001, we moved back to the United States. But during my time there, I was still being blessed with the idea of working in the landscape and being connected to the landscape itself. I was very fortunate to work on Rosalind Park, which is a very signature park uh, outside of Melbourne. You can see some of the photos here. And it was still that deep connection with the landscape that I had enjoyed as a childhood that my parents gave me in, in camping and being outdoors that allowed me to immediately adapt to yet a different culture and a different climate, but still understanding the importance of environmental systems. After that, I moved to Australia, to the Roaring Fork, I'm sorry, to Colorado, to the Roaring Fork Valley, which is where Aspen's located. We bought our first house in 2002, that was a big deal. I joined Design Workshop in 2007, became an associate of the firm in 2000, I'm sorry, joined Design Workshop in 2004, became an associate in 2005. In 2006, I had what I refer to as the Santa Fe Epiphany. At Design Workshop, you have to, have to be a principal to become a, I'm sorry, you have to have a master's degree to become a principal. And my principals in Aspen office told me to really get moving on. I didn't want to get a degree in landscape architecture. 
So we were down in Santa Fe, and I could experience that Native American artwork and that connection to nature, and even the modern artwork and its connection to nature. And I thought, that's it. That's what I need to do. And that's when I committed to graduate school and moving to uh, Austin, Texas. But to give you a brief taste of what I did in Australia, I worked on great projects like Residences at the Little Nell, which was much more about hospitality tied to recreation, tied to being outdoors. You can see a common theme. Childhood farmland, Australia parks, Colorado outdoor recreation. I was able to actually do artwork. This uh, piece up in the upper left-hand corner of this tapestry, this large gabion wall art piece within the project to the rooftop garden that you see on the uh, right-hand side. I also was afforded the opportunity to work on many signature estate projects, such as the Woody Creek Garden as a 2007 Na National ASLA award-winning project, where I could really take advantage of the idea of reflectivity in the changing landscape, the changing skies, the changing patterns, the changing materials that the Roaring Fork Valley is blessed with. And then I also was fortunate enough to get involved with urban design and redevelopment, such as the Avon West Town Center. Avon's at the base of where Beaver Creek Ski Area is, working with the community to re-envision what their downtown could be and providing landscape architecture associated with that, very, or with that project. But like I said, in 2007, we moved, to, we moved to Austin. We left Aspen with a calendar that was 20 months long, and we were going to land in Austin the very last day I could be, before I started graduate school, and we had a plan to return to Aspen the day that I graduated in 2009. We still haven't left. We decided once we were down there that there's a significant opportunity for a design workshop to participate in the South Central United States market. So we opened up an office in 2008, 90 days before the greatest recession that my generation's ever experienced and your generation's ever experienced. That was a very, very difficult time. We had our business plan all written on the economic model of 2007 and completely were blindsided in 2008. But in 2009, I finished graduate school but the thing that I noticed when I went to, to University of Texas, and this is where this disconnect of nature started to reveal itself for me that I got so concerned about. As I walked in on my very first day at the University of Texas, I saw this leaky water spigot, which you can see in the photographs above. That water spigot was just dripping, 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 and no one seemed to care that the fact that all this water was just wasting away. So I asked the facilities department, to please fix it. They ignored me. I asked the facilities department again. They ignored me. I asked the facilities department a third time. They ignored me. I said, great, I've got my first art piece ready to go. So the neglect of the invaluable was this idea. I first started to mark off like a dead body, because it's dead water to me, how the water was dripping out of the spigot. And you can see in the top three photographs. And chalking over the course of the day, so as the landscape heats up in August in Texas, that's about 105 degrees, by the way, on the south side of a building, that water was basically evaporating off the landscape. And so I was able to monitor that over the course of the day. But then I said, that's not enough. No one's caring enough. So I started to collect the water in one gallon jugs. And in one week's time, I, I could fill 100 jugs of water. And so I just said, all right, I'm putting it out there. And then I reflected back on my days at Polyarch, traveling to all the great cathedrals throughout uh, Europe. I said, this water's dead. It's captured. Let's make a memory uh, or a memorial out of it. And so I captured all the water, put these light candles out there, and just let it be. And people were walking by, probably asking, what in the world is this guy doing? But you can see how it looks in the evening. It was just a beautiful situation with the water reflect, or the light reflecting off of the water. But here's the result and the reality, is that it was losing 100 gallons a week or 5,200 gallons in a year. A dripping spigot, drip, 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 5,200 gallons in a year. That's the equivalent of 174 gallons based on my water bill of that year, but it's also the equivalent size of filling up a residential swimming pool. And that's amazing and that's extraordinary. So what happened was is I did this intervention and as I was doing it, as the newspaper was interviewing me, the maintenance truck drove about 30 miles an hour, popped the curb, slammed on his brakes, got out five minutes, fixed the water spigot, 
and everything's good to go now. So sometimes you have to just get out there to make a substantial change. But Texas has not always been kind to me. In 2009, uh, my father passed away. In 2009, the recession was in full swing. In 2010, my daughter Pearl was born, who's here with us tonight. She is the one light um, in these years. In 2011, I had a tumor. And I was admitted to a cancer center. In 2012, my mother-in-law passed away. Those were trying times, and that was winter for me, winter in a bad way. So throughout my entire life, I'd only ever experienced spring and summer and, f and fall. I never had experienced a winter before. I was also in my final year where I had to do an exhibition for my work uh, in fine arts, and so I did this piece reflective of my father who was so connected to the outdoors, taught me so much about being a servant leader that I did not even know at the time what he meant. And servant leader, again, because I apologize for uh, ha having a, a, a moment there, a servant leader is one who leads by serving. Think about a pyramid of leadership. The typical pyramid is like this, where the leader is on top. A servant leader is the other way around. That person's job is to be a servant to others so that they can help fulfill their desires, their goals. It's not the top-down approach, it's the bottom-up approach. And so this art piece is reflective of my father of leaving us, lifting up, and leaving that dirt behind with the leaves and the organicness behind it. That chalk, that dust, that residue that he left for us to learn from. And the lights that shine onto the suspended art piece and all the shadows that it creates, all my ancestors. And those details of just being absent of life and ascending above. I had to do that for my own peace of mind, and that was my final art piece in my, uh, my uh, uh, f uh, completion at UT. But remember at the beginning, I talked about how winter, or seasons in, in particular, it's not about being present in the season. It's about what you do out of the season and about what you can do as a result of what you've learned. No different than nature does. Think about it. A tree blooms in the spring. It creates fruit over the summer. The seed falls to the earth in the fall. It goes quiet in the wintertime to restore its energy, only to see spring come around to regenerate itself. So in my winter, I learned four amazing things. One is that life is too precious. I turned 40 this year. While that's not old to some, it is to others. How to carry out the legacy that was given to me. I grew up in Yorktown. At the time I grew up in Yorktown, I think when I left Yorktown, it was about three to 4,000 people. Nearly 1,300 people came to my father's calling hours. They stood out in the cold for four hours, waiting in line to see my father and to see us. I didn't realize what that legacy was until that day. Design is truly a gift for sharing, which was something new for me. Up until that time, I thought design was for me, and something I get to do, and it's something that I get to basically place onto somebody else, and that my beginning had come to an end. I don't mean that in a morbid sense that my beginning had come to an end, but I'd received, I had come to a new chapter in my life, that I needed to make a new life and make a new imprint. And that imprint was about being a sponge, where the sponge of my formative years, I was taking it all in. I was taking everything that all the professors that you have here will teach you, and the professors that taught me, and my time in Australia, and my time in Colorado, my time growing up in, next to a cornfield. And now I'm wringing that out. And I'm wringing that out with knowledge of leadership, the ability to take risk and know that I will survive, to be an advocate for, profession, for our profession, not from environmental stewardship, but also community stewardship. The notion of being able to give is the way of receiving, to being selfless, and to finding out that there's a calling for us as designers 
to deal with social, social justice, that every single thing that we do is a, has a design problem. And there are many ways that design can resolve many issues in this world. And so that leads me to Design Workshop and why I'm here to stay at Design Workshop and now a partner at Design Workshop. We have this idea of legacy or sustainability that is idealized in four categories, environment, economics, community, and art. And when those four come together, we truly believe that magic happens. And so we call that legacy design. I'm going to talk about that with a few of my projects in just a minute. We also have this idea of giving back and making sure that learning is a lifelong process. And so when an entry-level person comes to our firm, for instance, we put them through a five-year plan. And the five-year plan says this. In year one, we will help you achieve certification to know how to put construction documents together. In year two, we will help you to become LEED certified. In year three, you will become uh, LAR, or get, get your LARE, your, your licensure for landscape architecture. In year four, you can either get AICP, American Institute of Certified Planners, or another type of accreditation. And in year five, you'll be thinking about graduate school, and we pay for all of it. And we pay for all of it. But the agreement is, is that you have to also be dedicated to Design Workshop as much as we're dedicated to you. We also have a foundation that we've created. So a certain portion of our profits go to this foundation that we call DW Foundation, where we work with Habitat for Humanity and other nonprofit organizations that are trying to make a difference in communities. And we donate our time, or we donate money, we donate our, our hands to build things. We also have a thing called Donation Vacation. If you take one, or if, if you donate a day of your time to work for a nonprofit organization, we will match it with an additional vacation day. We think that's important. We think that you can't be just designers behind a desk. You have to be advocates in the community. We're very involved with American Society of Landscape Architects, LAF, TCLF, Urban Land Institute, and American Planning Association. We sit on the boards of every single one of those organizations. But today, I, I want to talk specifically about nature deficit disorder. Nature deficit disorder is what I started to experience in Texas. Remember, Indiana, farms. Australia, parks. Colorado, recreation and open space. Texas, 5,200 gallons of water dripping out of a spigot. So it was a real eye-opener for me. And so nature deficit disorder is this idea that Richard Louv has come up with, saying that when we spend less time outdoors, we have a wide range of behavior problems. And while some may think it's a theory, here are the facts. Youth average eight hours a day on electric media, teens up to 12 hours, even taking their cell phones and Game Boys and whatever else to bed with them. Nine million youth in the United States alone are overweight. The Institute of Medicine claims that over the past 30 years, childhood obesity has more than doubled. 70% of children are vitamin D deficient in the United States today from a lack of sunlight. This was the most astonishing one because I have a preschooler here. 50% of the preschoolers in the United States are never taken outside to play. Their entire play world over the course of the day is inside. I can't even imagine the type of person I would be if I didn't have the opportunity to be outside playing in that cornfield or going camping with my family or fishing with my brother. There's a constant denied access to nature that increases anxiety and behavior issues. 37% increase in HDHD in the last 20 years in the United States directly tied to nature deficit disorder. And the number one reason that research has found is parental fear. I'm afraid my daughter will get bit by a fire ant in Texas. I'm afraid she'll get poison ivy. I'm afraid a tree will fall on her. I don't know. We all make excuses as parents, but the point is, is that the research associated with it comes right back to me as a parent. I'm the one who has to break that mold, and someday you all will be parents, and you will have to break that mold. So a few of the quotes from The Last Child in the Woods, uh, which is a great book. I, all, I encourage you all to read it by Richard Louv about saving our children from nature deficit disorder. It's really amazing because you have to think, those children who are never experiencing nature, 
in the outdoor world in their preschool will eventually be leaders of our country and leaders of our communities. So I'm going to jump into a few projects here that are all tied with reconnecting with nature in a whole variety of environments. The first one is the Houston Arboretum and Nature Center, um, which you can see the, the awards that it has been recognized with today. So the Houston Na uh, Arboretum and Nature Center, or HANK, I'm going to refer to it as HANK, is located in Memorial Park. Memorial Park is um, twice the size of New York City in Houston. It's right on Buffalo Bayou, which is equivalent of White River. They call them bayous in the south. But what happened was the Arboretum and the Memorial Park were drilled by back-to-back -back catastrophic events. In 2008, Hurricane Ike brought in 82-mile-an-hour winds and dropped in over 12 inches of rain within 12 hours. Less than 30 months later, Texas was going to experience the worst drought that it had ever had on record. We had 14.8 inches in Houston that entire year of 2011. So in 12 hours of Hurricane Ike, 30 months before that, we had nearly the same amount of rain as we had the entire year. And in Texas, we had 5.6 million tree, urban trees lost. So a tree living in an urban environment, 5.6 5 .6 million trees. In Austin alone, we had 73 days in a row of plus 100 degree temperatures in 97 days without rain. It was devastating. Well, we were hired by the Arboretum because they had lost all the, uh, they, they had dealt with these big swings between the, the uh, hurricane and then the drought. And in this process, we had to step back and say, well, I wonder why that happened. What we learned was is that Houston is this concentration of multiple ecosystems that come together. In this historic photo that you can see, we realized that it was a combination of prairie and trees, a.k.a. savanna. So we came up with a master plan to redefine the entire property, dealing with a series of trails, a new visitor center, a new variety of experiences, new facilities, new gardens, et cetera, for people to enjoy. But here's the, here's the facts. Everything, everything that you see in those circles were trees that had died. 65% of the trees died in, or were severely damaged in the Houston Arboretum in 2011 because of that swing between water and lack of water. Today, the plan is to restore it in this manner. As you can see, there's a lot of trees being removed, and I'm going to explain why. Because when we started to f jump into how these trees died, we learned a couple things. We mapped watersheds. We looked at topography. We looked at slope conditions. We looked at different soil types for various plant communities. And we looked at where the tree canopy survived and where it didn't. All the red dots represent trees that died. And what we found out is that trees that were in prairie and savanna type soils with low drainage, which is very typical of prairie and savanna soils, and flat, had the highest mortality of trees. So what that meant to us was is that that landscape should not even have trees in the first place because it wasn't resilient. It wasn't able to take that pendulum swing of a hurricane and then a drought. So we have put forth a plan that will actually take an arboretum and take out trees. Think about that, an arboretum to take out trees. But what we were able to do out of that was to convince the client and convince the community that the restoration of the prairie and savanna landscape was the way to go. Now, understanding natural systems, that can't happen overnight. And so the first thing that we have to do is remove the dead trees. Find repurpose of those trees, whether that means turning it into mulch, into furniture, part of the architecture, whatever it may be. Propagate plants that had not been growing on site. Start to install those plants and establish those plants. And then finally manage and evaluate that. And that's going to take about 40 years to do. This is a $42 million implementation project. It's very substantial. So if you can imagine each one of those dots being a tree in 2007, the, tree, the canopy was pretty much covering the whole site. By 2013, we overlaid those red dots, as you mentioned before. Now we're in the process of selective clearing the trees that had died or the trees that should not be growing in the prairie and savanna landscape to resetting the landscape, 
So you're seeing that landscape emerge, that prairie and savanna landscape emerge, and then finally the 2044 horizon of that maturing into a truly holistic, sustainable landscape. Now make no mistake, we're only doing that in areas where the soils are telling us that. There's a whole host of soils and drainage patterns that were typical of the woodland landscape. And you know what? Those trees survived the drought and the hurricane because they were growing in their native state. They weren't growing in this artificial area. And so the landscape generally looks like this. This is some of our renderings as we move forward of making sure that the planting is based on micro uh, topography, that they increase wildlife habitat, they manage invasive species. We go through sensitive habitats with various boardwalks through the bogs and wetlands. We restore existing ravines that are on site to improve water quality. And then we're also advancing the trail network itself. So the trail experience is quite diverse in itself. So you can see a prairie trail environment on your left with different plants that you would experience to the woodland trails to the savanna trails and the bog type of trails. But one thing I want to stop at for a moment and just quickly digress here is that you've seen a lot of nice graphics and make no mistake, we do a lot of nice graphics and we do it on purpose and we spend a lot of time, but it doesn't, it's not born out of Photoshop, okay? It's born out of this hand right here. So these are some of the sketches that I'm working on right now for a children's discovery garden. In the, in the arboretum itself. And the task at hand was immerse children in nature. That's what, they, that's what the arboretum asked me to do. Come up with a children's garden that immerses children into nature. And, and we're, we're working on it. The reason why I put this up here is because, admittedly, we have a whole host of staff that aren't much older than you all, that are sort of the 23 to 27-year-old and they do primarily things on computers. They don't draw much anymore. And I'd love to see them draw. And so I was showing them these drawings, which I did on the flight to Boston the night of September 11th, listening to the Foo Fighters song. See how it's all kind of coming together here. And the response I got from my staff was, so that's what the inside of your brain looks like. And I said, actually, that's probably pretty accurate. Because it's through the drawing that the Malcolms and Les and Michelles of this world taught me and taught Lauren back there, allows us to be able to graphically communicate what's in our brain. It allows us to draw and to think and cycle. And I drew all of these in an hour and a half time. That's what's so, that's what's so great about being able to sketch quickly is that you can put things on paper quickly and look at it and review it and acknowledge for what it is. Moving on to the Bagby Street Reconstruction Project in Houston, Texas. This is probably uh, the project that I think has made the most substantial impact in Houston to date. And you can see the awards that it has won, uh, including Congress of the New Urbanism, or for the New Urbanism, rated it the Charter Award of the Best Street in the United States this past year. Bagby Street is located between downtown. Houston in the medical district immediately south of downtown, and this was an existing condition of Bagby Street. And we originally started the project, they, all they wanted to do was replace a storm line 25 feet below grade. And what they were going to do is lay the slopes back, and when they did that, in order to replace that pipe, they were going to tear out the trees and the sidewalks and just, we we're going to have to do the plain Jane, you know, fixer up or not, not too exciting. But when we started to get into it, what we learned was a couple of amazing things. One is that the, the city uh, public works department desired for it to be a four-lane road, but when we did our traffic impact analysis, it was only about seven to 8,000 cars a day, which suggests two lanes of traffic. So we felt that this was an opportunity because we had a client, the Midtown Redevelopment Authority, who wanted to create a walkable, vibrant, mixed-use district, but we had a public works department who wanted it to be a four-lane thoroughfare. And those don't play well together. And so we were able to work a design process where we were able to put the road on a diet and start to think about uh, sustainable infrastructure in a whole new light. And so we were able to overlay all these analysis maps. We looked at heritage trees. We looked at existing irrigation. We looked at traffic data. We looked at the number of... Um, traffic accidents that occurred at every intersection. We looked at land use, so areas that were mixed use in nature, 
need more sidewalk and more space than of a residential area. And when you overlay all that together, you get a street environment that I, and you're, you'll see in the images here in just a minute, that every block had to be custom designed for the, the analysis and what those influences were telling us. This whole notion of one size fits all for a street section is not worthy in an urban redevelopment project because you have influences that change the mood and the attitude of every, every single street. And so the results are this. We increased shade by 88% by strategically planting new trees and saving heritage trees that would have normally been removed. We have a 14% 14 de 14 decrease in hardscape surface temperatures. And why is that important in Houston? in Houston? Go there in August sometime and you can figure it out for yourself. It's 105 degrees with 99% humidity. You need to create some sort of human comfort if you want people to walk outside. And the way that you do that is you mess up one of three things. You either change temperatures, you change the humidity, or you change the air movement. And if you don't think those are the three, when it's hot in August, do you turn on your air conditioner? Because that changes the air movement, changes the humidity, and it changes the temperature, right? So if you disrupt any of those three, you can start to get to human or to heat island effect. Well, we learned in this process through this really great thing we have as a site analysis backpack. It's this backpack we carry around. It has all these cool gadgets. Uh, and one of the gadgets we have is a heat island gun. So we can literally shoot this laser down at a surface, and it tells us what the temperature is of that material in full sun. So I can measure what asphalt is or concrete or brick pavers or concrete unit pavers or turf in the sun or in the shade at any given time anywhere. And what we found out in this process is that brick pavers actually have less heat island effect than concrete does. So in areas where we didn't have immediate shade from mature trees, we put concrete. And where we ha didn't have it, we put concrete unit pavers because we were trying to reduce the surface temperature so people didn't get overheated during that process. But a couple other things that we did is we actually increased the pedestrian area by 276%. We increased the existing tree area by 42%. So there used to be, let me get my cursor up here, there used to be a travel lane right here next to this tree and it continued on and went right next to this tree. So we were able to increase these growth areas for these existing trees, giving them longer life. In the concrete mix for both the road, the curb, sidewalk, the foundation, everything like that, we used 25% fly ash in, in the concrete mix. Does everyone understand what fly ash is? I'll quickly tell you if you don't. So cement is one of the main ingredients of concrete. Cement is a carbon producer. Like it's really, really bad carbon producing process. But you can use fly ash instead of cement to help reduce that, uh, that process. 300 tons on this one project is the equivalent of me driving my car for the next 150 years. Imagine if every single project you work on when you become a professional is able to use 15, 20, 25% fly ash. What a substantial change you'll make in the air quality index for the community that you're working in. We also saw a 20% increase in rental property along this corridor once it was built and $45 million worth of private redevelopment that occurred along the 10 block, $10 million street corridor. We saw it seeding increase by 38%. We used 100% native and adaptive plants. This is where it gets really exciting for the stormwater. Remember this project all started about putting a pipe underground. We were able to build these rain gardens and use the proprietary soil mix complementing the planting design itself. And so 33% of the watershed that drains into Bagby Street goes through these rain gardens. And because each of those rain gardens have monitoring wells, I know for a fact that 75% of the bacteria that's in that stormwater is removed before it leaves the site. 73% phosphorus, 93% oil and gas, and 85% total suspended solids. You will not find a street in Texas in an urban environment that has any higher environmental qualities than this street alone. It's in Houston, Texas. But we also had an artistic side to it. Remember, I have this Master of Fine Arts. I've got to figure out a way to use it. And so each of the rain gardens, we were able to sandblast in 
what a two-year storm event, or what that rain garden would cleanse out of a two-year storm event. So in this specific one, 46,300 gallons of storm water is cleansed in that one rain garden in a two-year event. And the reason why we did this for twofold, one, when it's dry, you, you all know this from first year, contrasting materials, right? Smooth concrete to rough concrete, people are attracted to that. Red and green, contrasting colors, soft surface to hard, sur or textured surface, contrasting. But those letters and those numbers fill up with water during a rain event, and then when it stops raining, the curb dries, but those letters are holding water. And so it has this ephemeral quality of communicating the environmental importance of the rain garden itself. But for those who weren't turned on by that idea, we were able to have a series of these interpretive signs that also communicated how the rain gardens work and advanced water quality. Meanwhile, we were able to reduce crosswalk distance by 45%. It takes seven and a half steps for me to cross the street uh, in, uh, in Bagby Street now. We also custom designed a series of bike racks. We increased lighting levels by four times. While that sounds like a lot, it's because the lighting levels were so horrible to begin with. It's only about 0.12 foot candles when we started, but the idea is that we took lighting very seriously and we lit the ground plane, we lit the eye level, and we lit upper story as well so that you could see people at many different levels. But it didn't stop there. We actually had this idea before the ribbon cutting that we were going to basically create guerrilla metrics, as if the street could talk. You all have heard of guerrilla art, I assume. So here's what we did. We knew everyone who was coming to the ribbon cutting ceremony was going to park in this parking garage here, and the ribbon cutting ceremony with the mayor was going to happen here. So they had to get out of the parking garage and walk down the street to get to the ribbon cutting ceremony. Now, we couldn't stand out all day and tell all these metrics and everything, but what we did say is we're like, we're going to make the street speak for itself. And so we put all these signs up throughout the entire two block corridor that shows that, that shows the performance of the street itself, forcing the dignitaries, forcing the writers of the various newspapers and presses to read about Bagby Street. Bagby Street, as a result, is the highest scoring project in the United States through the Green Road certification process. Green Road certification is what lead us to buildings or sustainable sites initiative is to landscapes. They do it for corridors, green roads. <laughs> Out of that process, Mayor Parker, who is right here, threw something on us that I was very excited about. At that ribbon cutting ceremony, she announced her complete streets executive order, partially based on the quality that Bagby Street had come in to be. So now we have an executive order because we pushed the envelope from doing a conventional streetscape project and transforming Houston from what it was to what it can become. Moving on to Blue Hole Regional Park in Wimberley, Texas, you can see the uh, awards for this project. Currently, it is the largest sustainable sites initiative certified project in the United States at 126 acres, and it's been uh, awarded state and national awards. Blue Hole Regional Park project, I had mentioned, is a 126 acre project that is primarily of nature or connection to nature, but it does have this component of of active recreation here in the middle with tennis courts, soccer fields, basketball courts, things like that. But it didn't always look like that. In Texas, in the hill country, which is central Texas, it's very much like southern Indiana. The limestone escarpment is there. It cracked an aquifer, and it's cold springs instead of warm springs. So people in the summertime seek these natural swimming holes to cool off. Again, 105 degrees. It's rather, rather uh, warm. And so this is a photo from the early uh, 1920s of children swimming in the Blue Hole area itself along Cypress Creek. But when we started the project, it was really overused and overrun, and it looked something like this. And today it looks like this. And we were able to save over 70% of the tree canopy, even though we added 320,000 square feet of new programming and amenities into the park. We also added 4.6 4 miles of trails throughout the park experience. This is me standing on the banks of Cypress Creek going, what in the world are we going to do with this? One thing that we noticed is that when we were standing on Cypress Creek, we looked across the creek, and we looked down the creek, and we looked up the creek, and we saw cypress trees just growing everywhere, which is the native 
or indigenous tree that grows along the bank, hence Cypress Creek. But in the Blue Hole Park area, there wasn't one found that was less than 50 years old. And that was proof that we were loving the site to death. And so when we evaluated how people were getting in and out of the swimming hole, what we also evaluated is that they were using all the roots of the cypress trees as their ladders. They were getting in and out everywhere, erosion problems, no new generative growth, it's a real problem. So today it looks like this. This is nearly the exact same photograph where we've identified four areas where people can get in and out of. Uh, we built this floating platform over the tree that you saw the kids climbing on many years ago. In this process of adding 320,000 square feet, we're actually able to reduce stormwater uh, by 19%, and we're able to literally collect 19 saplings of bald cypress, which I'm going to point to one. There's a little guy right there and reestablish them along the Cypress Creek corridor. So in a hundred years from now, when those trees that we climb on today are dead, that generation will have another set of trees to, to climb and swing off and, and enjoy Cypress Creek for what it is. The main entrance looked like this. At one point in time, we were able to uh, change it completely and collect water uh, in a cistern that will help us, or that helps us with a demonstration garden. We also have another cistern on site that provides all the water for the toilets uh, in the project, which is uh, great as a harvesting aspect. We're able to develop these interpretive signs that communicate all these environmental features that we have for the project. Nature-based play, we have six nature-based play, remember nature deficit disorder, nature-based play elements, including taking these invasive ash juniper trees that we had to take down and as we were taking them down, we're like, wow, these are beautiful. What if you turned them upside down, cleaned them off, and now they become teepees for little children to run in? And this is easily the number one feature next to swimming at Blue Hole Regional Park. These kids just love going through these elements. Guess how much that costs our client? Nothing. Um, we actually saved $230,000 for our client just by harvesting these ash junipers for nature-based play features, mulch, bollards, fencing, wheel stops, whatever you name. We also led two plant in the park days. One of them was actually a wetland restoration where we donated our time on a Saturday and taught the community how to plant uh, and restore wetlands. And then this one in particular, planting trees around one of the playgrounds. We saved $40,000 just by reusing boulders that were found on site in, in a meaningful way. But this is where it gets really exciting. So we as designers want to design, but we never think about the economics of, of a park. And that's really important. This park cost zero dollars in taxpayer money to maintain. Zero dollars. There's only a handful of parks in the United States that allow for that. And the way we were able to do that is we wrote the operations and maintenance plan the same time we were designing the park itself. Think about that. Think about how often you see a park get built and it looks great in year one, but by year two you're starting to see some wear and tear. By year three it's even worse. By year four it's even worse. Ten years out of the gate, things are falling apart and there's no revenue or means to fix it. Blue Hole Regional Park doesn't have this. It actually makes money for the city. It pays for all their staff, all their overhead, all their equipment, because of the way that we anticipated revenue coming in through various rentals and, and paying to get into the swim hole itself. And then we also created a 30% endowment to fix those issues long, uh, d down the road. And a quick example of that, we call it the three-time model, is that if, if you wanted to buy a bench for the park itself, we would sell it to you, not we, but the city would sell it to you for $3,000. Well, it only cost $1,000 to build, but you got your name on it. It says, whatever, Capalum student, blah, blah, blah. So $1,000 went to building the bench. $1,000 went to the endowment to fix the bench someday, which will now create interest. And then the last $1,000 went to those other things in the park that people don't want to get their name recognized to. No one wants to have the Steven Spears Memorial Mulch Pile, right? No one's interested in that. But somebody had to pay for it. So that's the way that we were able to do it. We've seen a significant increase in people visiting the park today. It's actually gone up to 44,000 people between Memorial Day and Labor Day. The year that we started, it was 10,000 people. So 
people are really enjoying the park and they're also paying anywhere from five to eight dollars to enter the park for the swimming hole itself. We had 19 endangered and threatened species that we had to protect on the site as well. Uh, we were able to uh, also create not, uh, sorry, 10 micro detention ponds on the park in the park itself to help slow down the stormwater runoff, to remove the erosion control issues, and let nature do what nature's supposed to do well. So the last project that I want to hit on is the Lafitte Greenway project in New Orleans. Many of you might have seen this project last year. It won the Presidential Award of Excellence at ASLA last year. Um, don't need to tell you what happened in 2005 in New Orleans. I think you all know what the devastation that occurred there. Well, out of that project or out of that storm, the city went through a visioning process where there was a handful of projects that that the, uh, the community desired as part of their reinvestment into the community. Number one was rebuilding the levees, but number two was to take this old abandoned corridor that connected the French Quarter, which is in gray here, to City Park, and then ultimately Canal Boulevard, which also has a trail planned for it that would connect all the way to Lake Pontchartrain. So in this map below, you have the French Quarter here and City Park up here. But the corridor wasn't always just a corridor itself. It actually is this amazing transect that goes through the richness and history of the city. It's actually built by General Carondelet in the 1700s as a way to bring shipping goods from Lake Pontchartrain to the backside of the French Quarter. Think of the Mississippi River as your international trade route, but think of the Carondelet Canal being where you're able to take hardwoods and other woodlands from uh, parts of Louisiana and bring it to the backside of the French Quarter to actually build. Well, that was filled in after World War II, or after the Civil War with the railroad, and then eventually the railroad went away, and so it became this derelict piece of land that divided the community. And so it's, when you add it all up, this 3.1 mile greenway is actually about 54 acres of, you can see it, derelict land adjacent to the downtown next to uh, French Quarter. But the site's complicated. 100% of the site was in the 100-year floodplain, there was 42% pervious coverage. 75% of the residents within a five minute walking distance actually live below sea level. I think our lowest point of the site is minus nine. And there were only 3% of the entire corridor area covered by trees. 1.7% of the residents only uh, biked to work. You gotta think about this greenway being the spine to connect people to downtown, to the French Quarter to Tulane University, to the LSU Medical Center, starts to connect, or could connect people uh, to the area. Um, there were seven historic and cultural distri districts, but nine communities that were in, in the corridor area itself, including Treme, the birthplace of jazz, including Congo Square, which has a historic connection back to the African American and slave societies of, of the past. It also has four Mardi Gras parade routes that go through the site and 34 culturally and historic significant places throughout the corridor itself. Long story short, you have this great history, but you have these neighborhoods that are really fractionalized from low-income housing to more higher-income housing with amazing socioeconomic uh, differences, and you're trying to stitch them all together through this greenway and linear park system. The way we were able to do that is through 75 stakeholder meetings for this 3.1 mile corridor. We were able to ask them questions through a series of technologies on if they believe that the Greenway, Greenway will contribute to their quality of life or if they even supported the Greenway. We even went through this process where we made maps at 1 to 100 scale created these chips of all the various programs that could occur along the Greenway. Volleyball courts, trails themselves, <coughs> basketball courts, soccer fields, farmers markets, community gardens, and we met with the community and we said, well, here are all the chips. You lay it out where you think all these program items should go. And we were able to synthesize all that to come up with a preferred plan on where the uh, park amenities should go. So the area in the bottom, as you can see, is the highlighted area at the top. This is specifically in the Lafitte housing, proj Lafitte housing area, which is this area here. Has anyone seen the movie Treme on HBO? Okay, never mind. 
this is where this is where it it goes through and so this community was absolutely devastated from the storm and so we were able to provide them with new sports fields with uh, splash pads pool orchards uh, community gardens community center bocce horseshoes all these things that they wanted with the trail running through it and this is what it looks like today this is the Lafitte housing uh, project and then the, the Greenway corridor itself. This project is now under construction, which is very exciting. We had to look at landscape typologies. We actually went through every single one of these natural systems in the Greenway, believe it or not, all six of them. We had to anticipate how storm water was going to work on this project. It's a very difficult situation when you think about storm water for a project that is nearly nine feet below sea level. What, what do you do? And so you had to be very creative on the way that water was held for certain events but allowed to flush for other stormwater events to reopening a canal that had been shut down for many years where 100 percent of the stormwater is now treated on site we have new connections uh, from one side of the greenway to the other we have artists involved with the project we've uh, continued to keep the impervious numbers fairly low and we created uh, a significant increase in tree canopy, specifically on the south side of the greenway, so that when the shade casts onto the greenway, it actually works. We actually looked at the way different multi-generational age groups wanted to use the uh, greenway itself. We looked at how buildings that were completely devastated from the storm could be adaptably reused for farmers market and other events and community gardens. And so with that in mind, there's a charge that I would like to give to you coming out of winter. Someday you're going to deal with adversity if you haven't already. And the situation that you or the opportunity you have in front of you isn't about what you do in the time of adversity. It's what you do after the adversity and how you can change and be something of greater quality and cause. I was speaking to a university a couple weeks ago, and we were talking about just the competitive, nearly cutthroat experiences that we all have experienced in landscape architecture programs. It doesn't just happen here in the competitiveness. You can go to the GSD at Harvard, you can go to the Wright School at LSU, and it's all the same. It's competitive. And while that builds a lot of character, and it helps you to be more independent, and for you to stand up for what you believe in, the charge I have for you is what do you do with that? Because at the end of the day, design is not about you or you or you or you. It's about these communities that you're going to work in, that you're going to forever change their life. It's about a community that's going to live in New Orleans that has not even been born yet. It's about a community in New Orleans where you deal with racism and how could a greenway actually break that down? We're teaming with Tulane University looking at, in, at human health impacts of the Greenway itself. And so they are mapping and monitoring health habits and recreation habits for that community within a five minute walking distance of the Greenway itself before the construction and after the construction. Imagine a world where architects and planners and landscape architects can actually be at the table to talk about the obesity that is hitting our country, or the nature deficit disorder that's hitting our country, or the healthcare coverage issues that are facing our country. And one of the reasons we're able to reduce that is through greenways and projects like that. So my charge to you is think beyond yourself. At some point in time, you're going to have to let the idea of design being about you to go to its wayside and be hand, to release the handcuffs and realize that your job and the skills that you have available to you are going to help a community that has not even breathed its first breath yet. That's going to be your legacy. And it's up to you to really make that happen. So at the beginning of the presentation, I played times like these by Foo Fighters. Dave Grohl says, it's times like these that you learn to live again. It's times like these that you give and give again. It's times like these time and time again. To me, that's what the back half of my career is going to be. The sponge has been squeezed. 
It's about advocacy. It's about change. It's about me allowing to help a community and putting my all into helping a community be somebody and something that is going to help a society that's not even yet been born yet. The ego's been checked at the door. The competitiveness has been gone. It's about my time and my tenure on this earth. So with that, as a reminder, we all have seasons. We will all deal with adversity. So what you do out of adversity that will make you a stronger person and a better designer. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> does anyone have any questions or comments or thoughts? I can bring the uh, microphone to anyone on this level. You guys are out of luck. Come on, I didn't silence you all. It's a, it's a lot to think about, and I think you've kind of set us all into a very reflective moment. Thank you. Really? Nothing? You you you've gotten them absolutely <laughs> speechless. This could be the this could be a historic moment <laughs> that no one's leaving. No, you know, no one's moving. They're just speechless. <laughs> there we go. Nicole, hang on. Thank you. Um, earlier, uh, we had a meeting, um, and we were talking about the legacy design process, and something you said is, um, if it can't be measured, then um, it, you won't do it. Or what can be measured gets done, That's not right. rather. Um, can you give, give us some examples? I think it's really easy to measure environmental um, met metrics like stormwater or uh, urban heat island, but can you give us um, metrics associated with some of the other components to your Venn diagram, sure. like specifically community and art? Sure, sure. Well, when, when you look at the Venn diagram and you see environment, economics, and community, you'll see that those are the three that are tied to the United Nations model for sustainability. And those are easier to measure, and certainly art is more difficult. What you call art and what I call art are two different things. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to answer the art, the art portion of your question a little bit separately than the others. Um, when, when we did the rain gardens on Bagby Street, Certainly, it was easy to start talking about the environmental benefit associated with that. And the audience that we presented that idea to may or may not have cared that much, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but when we started to think about it more holistically in, the, in that Venn diagram, we thought, well, so Bagby Street, because it's an urban thoroughfare, had zero requirements for stormwater quality had zero requirements for stormwater detention based on the current laws. But we had a client who was willing to do that and honestly spend a little extra money to make that happen. The reason why they wanted to do that is because the demographic of that redevelopment area is a 25 to 40 year old single, no kids, or married, no kids. Um, we, we jokingly call Midtown as the area that you work like an adult but still play like a kid because it has about $80,000 median income level, but the average unit size is 700 square feet. So it'd be, you know, like one bedroom, one bath with an $80,000 salary tagged to it. It's, they've got a fair amount of disposable income. And so they wanted to help uh, further define their community through these environmental aspects of, of Bagby Street to say, you know, that's our demographic. They want to be tied to something of a greater worthy cause. 
and w we know that to be true generally. And so um, we, we were able to do that. But on the economics front, that was when it got a little bit tricky. And so we said, okay, if we didn't have to do stormwater quality or stormwater detention for this project, what's going to be the reward out of redevelopment authority? Because they, they need economic and redevelopment to survive. That's their whole vision and purpose. So what we were able to do is we were able to write into the preliminary engineering report, which is a document that goes to the city that evaluates what we're going to do and basically authorizes it with a signature. And we were able to create water quality credits in each of those rain gardens in the public right-of-way that Midtown Redevelopment, Redevelopment Authority now owns. So if you are a developer and you're coming to Houston, and you're like, hmm, I'm looking at property in Midtown, or I'm looking at property in Uptown, Midtown can say, well, I've got all your water quality credits. You want to come play in my neighborhood? And that's worth, you know, it could be like $50,000, which is a pretty decent amount of money. And so they can transfer those water quality credits to you as the developer, as long as you come into, obviously, the neighborhood to develop. And so therefore, then that, that development itself induces and creates increment, which is what a redevelopment authority is built on. They're a tax increment financing district. So they get the increment of tax of property values uh, between pre-development to post-development um, for the duration of its life. And so it's a major economic generator. But the rain gardens, I think, have, have gotten uh, a little more attention in all four circles because I just explained to you the economic value of them. There's a community value to them, and obviously a community education value to them. We already know the environmental value. You saw those numbers. But the artistic side or the vernacular, and that is something when people see it, they're like, oh, that's Midtown. So now we've hit on the aesthetics or the way that we sandblasted the text into the curbs of the rain gardens, you know, trying to find artistic ways to effectively communicate a design idea. But on, on the art front, to answer that question a little bit separately, one of the things that I've been researching, and I'm, I'm in charge of the legacy art circle and at Design Workshop, we sort of have these leaders in each of the four categories, and that is trying to define what art is, because art to you is different than it is to me or different to my mother or even to my daughter. And so it's one of those things where what we're trying to now look at in a more provocative way is understanding how human senses are engaged in, an, in a design effort. So the way that you feel in a space, the smell, the comfort that you have, and it's different for everyone. If my wife was walking down a dark alley in Muncie, Indiana, she would have a completely different feeling as a female than I would as a male. And so we're trying to figure out how sensory can affect design in a positive way because what many scientists have started to realize is that we might actually have a sixth sense, and that is not the bad Bruce Willis movie. Uh, the sixth sense being memory. And if you think about it, it makes sense. As a child, you touch something that's hot, and you remember that, and you're like, I'm not going to touch that again, right? Or if you do, you learn the hard way. So it creates memory, and you make a decision based on that. I have a great experience in a park, so I return to that park. My wife and I come to, come to Indiana nearly every October, and we bring our daughter with us because of human senses because of the smell of the freshly cut cornfields we remember as a child, or stomping through the leaves that have fallen from the tree, or the reds and orange and yellows that are on the tree. When, when we flew in on Thursday, Pearl said, what's all that red and yellow stuff as we were in the airplane looking down? And we said, those are trees. We don't have that in Texas. It's either green or dull green. Pick your color. It's not, it's not very attractive. But the reason why we do that is because in October specifically is because it was all those senses that we had as a kid. We smelled a fire burning this past weekend. And we were like, oh, I remember that feeling as a child being outside in the fall and breathing that fresh air. So we're trying to look at how sensory is really the, the new vocabulary for art. Yes? Well, you were talking about 
Yours are on. Uh, well, so if you were, when you talked about how you're trying to integrate art into the landscape, how, like, have you tried uh, looking down avenues through music and how that related and what types of things maybe you've tried to incorporate with it or maybe not? A, a bit, it, admittedly not as much as letting music um, influence the form giving. Uh, obviously in New Orleans we had to think about the various parades and the music that comes with that. Um, periodically you'll hear me in the design studio talking about making crescendo moments in the design itself, but admittedly we, we probably haven't done that as much as we could or should. Yeah, it's a, it's a good, very good observation. <laughs> um, it depends on the time of year. There's, in the summertime, there's a couple of these. There's no doubt about that. We have a whole host of things. We have um, the heat gun that I mentioned. We have uh, speed radar. We have a decibel reader. Um, the, the decibel reader has been very enlightening. We're working on a project right now in downtown Taylor, Texas, and TxDOT has, has encouraged uh, industrial through traffic to come right through their downtown, unfortunately, and we measured decibel levels north of 80 decibel levels. Just as a point of reference, anything over 67 by the Federal Highways Administration suggests a sound wall. So TxDOT's decision of allowing industrial traffic to go through their downtown is completely voided out the whole idea of having outdoor dining because you'll be yelling at each other the whole time and that's just not necessary and so we, we use that to make the case um, so let's see there's the, the heat island gun I, w I wish I would have brought it with me although security probably would have had a great time with that one um, the, the heat island gun the radar detector the decibel reader oh the the light meter reader is very important to us there's, yes, there, there's compass. Um, don't have a metronome. That'd, that'd be good. Then. Uh, that goes back to your question, right? Um, but it's been very valuable. When, when I was walking, when, when we started the Lafitte Greenway project and we were walking up and down that 3.1 mile corridor in July, uh, it was very, very hot and we came across this elementary school on the Greenway that had a brand new playground I think partially funded by the hurricane recovery funds. And it was nice, you know, it was brand new and it had a rubberized surface, fall surface. And I think off the cuff we can all be like, oh great, they recycled rubberized surface, it's wonderful. Well, I put my heat gun to it. In July at three o'clock in the afternoon, it was 170 degrees, 170. So I immediately pulled out my iPhone. I'm like, this is crazy. What's 170 degrees look like? And what I found out is that when you touch 170 degree temperature for five seconds, you get a second degree burn. And this was a children's playground. Because they did not measure heat island effect in material surfaces and didn't think about shade. They would have had a shade sail over it or trees, or something to block that sun coming down. Probably would have been about half that temperature. But instead it was 170 degrees. So when children were sliding down the slides, they weren't crying because they bummed their knee. They were crying because they burnt their knee. And that's, that's devastating. And you know what? That's on us as professionals. A landscape architect designed that playground. We did that. We as a profession did that. We've got to stop that. So we, we use that in a very purposeful way to measure we've got to stop doing certain things or we need to change certain patterns. Um, I think this could have some application to the, you were talking about the memory and the senses, um, but you were talking about a play, uh, cornfield being your playground as a kid. Yep. Um, and it reminded me of where we lived across from my grandparents when I was a kid. We had this, it was a small woods, but I remember creating, you know, there was like a bush around a tree that I thought was a cave. We called it bush cave. And then there was one you could climb was a lookout. It was a lookout cave. And I like would map it out. Um, 
And I, was thinking, I think the most impactful, meaningful things as a kid were things that I discovered, not particularly designed. So do you think about that? I think it applies to all design, but especially for kids' design and exploring an environment. Do you try it? How do you balance the just a sense of building a sense of discovery into something that's intentional and designed? Um, so yeah. Every single one. That's something I purposely do. Every single one of my projects has a little thing in there that you have to go find. And you know what? Sometimes they don't find it. Maybe I'm the only one who knows about it, and that's fine. Um, but it, for instance, when, when you go down the pathway down to uh, the Blue Hole swimming area after you go through the uh, office and bathhouse area, there's this one 180-degree uh, turn, and there's a pause point, and you look out, and there's this enormous bald cypress, six foot eight inch caliper bald cypress sitting in the middle of this wetland. And we couldn't get out to it because it's in the middle of the wetland, so we're trying to f figure out a way to bring that experience to the user. And so on the ground plane, there's a stone paving pattern that maps out the actual tree trunk itself. And we felt that this tree, because it was, I think it's 400 years old is what was mapped, um, had almost like this ghostly, godly type of feel to it that in the middle, if you stand right in the middle of this tree trunk pattern, we actually created an echo chamber. And so when you stand in there and you talk, all you do is hear your voice all around you. And what we're trying to do is to create sort of that grandiose, sort of, like I said, godly-like quality of this 400-year-old tree in an almost experiential way. And is it fun to some people? Yeah. Do the other people walk by and don't even, don't even notice? That's fine, too. So we always try to put a little bit of play in, in our work so it's not so darn serious all the time. And then the other thing is, if, if you recall with the Houston Arboretum project where I showed those, hand, those little hand sketches that I did on the plane, that whole project is a children's discovery garden. It's meant to be that all together. Uh, another example is we designed this swimming, uh, this, this swimming complex in uh, Austin recently, and it has all these different pools for different age groups based on cognitive learning and, and their experience of working with water. And um, the pool that, you know, it's basically like 42 inches deep to five feet deep, so children are just learning how to swim. We put all these gadgets in the plaster all over the place, and so it's sort of this underground scavenger hunt, or underwater scavenger hunt. N not all firms get that playful, but we like to throw in a little curveball here and there just to make it a little more fun keeps us on our toes, keeps us thinking like children too. That's the, m my favorite thing out of doing this discovery garden is watching my daughter and her friends play and being like, oh yeah, that's so much fun to chase each other around a circle, whatever. Like, no, I don't do that at 39 and a half years old. So um, if there are any more questions? We've kept him a bit here, but um, maybe we could just come up afterwards if you have some more questions and have a few minutes to talk with Steve before he goes. So if you could, uh, let's give him a round of applause and thank you very much. Thank you.